So Howard, tell us a little bit about the Kensington runestone, the history of it, how it was discovered. I would love to. The story starts, like any story, at a certain point. It starts with a man by the name of Olaf Oman in November of 1898. Olaf was an immigrant from Sweden who got a piece of land up what, what is now Kensington, Minnesota. He built his farm there. And on that farm, of course, you had a lot of trees, and you had to remove the trees to get land for farming. Of course. Okay. And so one way he got them out was to uh, what they call grubbing, grubbing trees. Okay. Oh. They would tie a, like a chain, trees about so big, tie a chain around it, and then he, he would winch it up you know, and pull a tree like this. Okay. And then the roots would be exposed. Okay, mm -hmm. now he and his little boy were out there doing this. And right away when the tree came up, his boy noticed there was something in the, the roots of that tree. Mm -hmm. And it turned out to be what we now know as the Kensington Rune Stone. Wow. So <laughs> purely by, by, by accident. Now, this stone, I have a, uh, just a small model of it right here. And how big would it, is the actual stone? Okay, the actual stone is about three feet high. Okay. About, um, about eight, eight, 18 inches wide. Oh, and about eight inches thick. Okay. So, and about 200 pounds. So wow. it, it's really, really <laughs> quite, quite the heavy, yeah. <laughs> and you can find the, 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 the stone itself today in the museum in Alexandria, in Minnesota, called the, the, Red, the Kensington a runestone museum. Now on this stone, Olaf found strange markings. Okay. And on this stone, of course, they, they turn out what they call runic writing. Okay, on this side of the stone, the flat side, there were nine lines, and on the edge here, there were three lines. Hmm. And this edge had been obviously smoothed out by a chisel probably just to make it nice and smooth so they get nice three lines here. Now they could have put all 12 lines here, plenty of room for it, but they chose to have the last three lines on the side of the stone. Okay, now we're getting to the cryptography part okay. <laughs> as, as far as that concerned. Now th this here is, is, is a better picture of it, it's an actual photograph for the actual stone. Okay. You see it's uh, line one through nine here. Mm -hmm and lines 10, 11, and 12 on this side of the stone. Now, <laughs> the, uh, now how in the world did, did these people get, now do you find, what the, on earth is something like this doing in Minnesota? Yeah, of all things. Yeah, <laughs> good, this is insane. But there it is. Yeah. Okay, and that's, that's a fact, that's not speculation, that's a fact, it was there, okay? Now we know that the Norsemen traveled throughout Europe a great deal, but they also came to the New World. They came to the Shetland Islands, they came to uh, the Faroes, they came to Iceland. Okay. It was in the, in the eight, late eight, 800s when they went there. And then in the, then, uh, the father of Leif Erikson had to leave Iceland because he murdered somebody. Oh, he no. was always murdering people. Okay, a good fellow. Anyway, he came and he, he left on, on the ships. He was banned from the country for a few years. He came to what is now Greenland and established what's called the Eastern Colony and the Western Colony in Greenland. And it's from there it was the jumping off point points to Vinland. Now his boy, Leif, of course, heard about this from uh, uh, another seaman called uh, Bjarne Hjulsen. And uh, Hjulsen told him about it. So Leif bought this guy's boat and he took off for, for this area down through here. And he followed the sailing instructions down to what is now Massachusetts and Rhode Island. Okay, now Leif spent the winter there and he, he attached the name Vinland to it. <laughs> okay, now that was in the year, I think, oh, maybe 1003 or something like that. Okay. Okay, uh, approximately. And uh, then the next evidence that we have someone was there is in Massachusetts. There's one of these runic inscriptions dated is November 26th, 1009. Okay. 1009, about six years after Leaf was there. And then the next inscription, the date we have for some of these runic inscriptions, we found them a number of places. Okay, of all places in eastern Oklahoma, 
Eastern Oklahoma. Wow. We, ha we have at least seven of them here. They're dated two from November of 1012, then we go to 1017, 1017, and 1024. And here in Eastern Oklahoma, there was, well, there was a large number of them. Over three dozen of them have, were just blown up in the 1920s and 30s because people thought they were secret markings for buried treasure. Oh. And of course it wasn't. <laughs> Good Lord, you know. So they destroyed a lot of wonderful history there. Then we found one in Ohio. Then in Newport, Rhode Island, we have a, a round stone tower. Oh, okay. A round stone tower right by, by, by the ocean there. Wow. Which is dated, uh, it's the second Sunday in Advent, December 10th, uh, 1116. Signed Henricus, who was the bishop. So they had a bishop too. Cool. Who Vinland did. See, okay. Now, the last one, and the, by far the, the, the biggest one that we've ever found anywhere in the world, Mm -hmm. is here in west central Minnesota, near Kensington. Okay. Now, how did they get there? Well, we can figure, we knew how they got to Massachusetts by the ocean and even to eastern Oklahoma mm -hmm. by going up around Florida and up the Mississippi and the Arkansas River. Okay, we, that, that's not too hard to figure out. But Minnesota? Good Lord. <laughs> See, okay. More than likely, they, they came this way. At least this is a waterway which they could have taken. We suspect, well, more than likely this was it. Mm -hmm. They come through the Hudson Strait here across Hudson Bay and into what's called the Nelson River and that takes you all the way up to Lake Winnipeg in Manitoba, Canada. And you go through Lake Winnipeg then you come to the Red River and you go up the Red River into what is now west central Minnesota. And we found some pretty good evidence that they were there. Whether they were there, how much of there where they were be before the Kensington Rinsen was created, we don't know, but we we're quite sure that they were there. Now, uh, <laughs> what did this Kensington runestone look like? Well, we know the physical appearance, but wh what was on it? What did it really yeah, say? Yeah, what does it say? Okay, <laughs> okay they, it's called runic writing. Okay. Runeskrift in, in, in Norse. And it's a type of symbols that they used in writing for, for many, many, many centuries. Now eventually this, this went out of fashion because of the of Christianity mm -hmm. and the Latin alphabet coming in. But they kept up, well, the entire books have, have been written with this. Wow. And uh, when they carved these, this, this dated cryptography, they liked to use this. Okay. Because they could carve it into rock and it'll stay there. That's good. You know, <laughs> in, 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 into granite, okay. Now this is the one that was found in, in Western Minnesota. We have your nine lines and your three lines. Keep in mind these three lines were on the side of the stone okay. and these were on, on the front face of the stone. Okay, here we go. Now, I, okay, Dodd, read, to read it in uh, mid 14th century Norse, but as I say, be, be, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I'm doing it as a 20th century native of Minnesota. So, okay. We ought to to or to a chugan norman, to up dogle safard pro Vinland off west. We had a lager way to clear in dog's race uh, nor fro the no stain. We were a fisker in dog after we come home from T. Mon Rude of blood or dead. A. V. M. And those are three from the Latin alpha mean Ava Virgo Maria. So it's probably done mm -hmm. by a priest more than likely. Then Frelsa of Ilia. Okay. Now on the side of the stone, then we had these three lines. Okay. Okay, har ti mons. We have ot se after vor sheep, fjorten dag reise fro deno de ar treten hundro to sexty. Okay. Okay, in English now. <laughs> okay, in English. Okay, <coughs> we have eight goths. Also, you know, the part there from Western Sweden, okay. and 22 Norsemen on the voyage of exploration from Vinland through the west, or towards the west. We uh, had a camp by two squid, that's sort of like, I think like, like rocks sticking out of the water, out of a lake. Okay. One day's travel north from this stone, okay. We went, were uh, and fished one day after we came home, found 10 men red with blood and dead. Then that Eva Virgo Maria again, okay. And uh, 
to save us from evil, which is a petition from the Lord's Prayer. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then on the side of the stone, in English, we, we have ten men by the sea or the ocean, meaning it's like a saltwater sea, okay. to look after our ships 14 days travel from uh, this island, the year 1362. Okay. Okay. So why do they put, say, three lines on the side? Is that like a signature, or is that standard practice with this type of runestone, this type of cryptography? Mimi, are you afraid to this? Well, I see there's nine lines on the front. You said you could oh, put yes. the other three. Oh, thank why? you. Yes. Th thanks for asking that here. You're with it. Okay. That was for cryptographic reasons. They could have put it all, all on one side of the stone, but he chose nine lines here and three lines here. And there is a re cryptographic reason for that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now, first of all, let's go to the, the fellow who, who did this. See, as time went on, the person who created the cryptographer, the cryptographer would conceal his name in the inscription, as well as dates. Okay. Okay. Uh, they didn't do that right away. It was pure dates. The ones in, in uh, say, in uh, Oklahoma, for example, the one in Massachusetts, that's pure dates. But that was much earlier. Mm -hmm. See, that was about three centuries, over three centuries before this. But as time went on, they became more sophisticated at this and concealed their name in it, too. Oh. Okay. <laughs> yeah, see. Now, one thing that you'll notice, numbers here. Yes. Okay. Four, two, four, five, six, seven, five, three, then six, five, four. This indicates the number of words in each line. Okay. That's, that's, that's critical. Also, okay, that, that, and you notice these numbers here, like eight and 22, these are rather strange looking symbols for numbers. Mm -hmm. They're called pentathic symbols. There is it's nothing runic about that. Okay. But these were often used like in what they call the Easter table which has to do with, with uh, time, which has to do with, with, with dating, okay? And the reason he'd used these was to attract attention. Okay. See, so you've got to attract attention a little bit, otherwise, if you hide your, your cryptography so well, no one finds it, that, 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 that's no fun. No. So you, so you want to give people who are also cryptographers some hints that something, hey, something is here. Okay. Now, if you're just a plain old historian or a runologist, you don't have the clue, <laughs> see? Okay, but it takes a cryptographer to decipher cryptography. Mm-hmm. See, now it's very sneaky. <laughs> yes, here we here we have the, the number two. Here we ha I put it in red to emphasize it. The number okay. ten. Here we have a number ten again, fourteen and one three six two. Now, as I say, once again, these were done to attract attention. Mm-hmm. Now, what the cryptographer did, he concealed his own name, for example, right after e e each one of these symbols based on the number of words in each line. Okay. Now, for example, he started out from the bottom. This is not unusual for this type of cryptography. He followed a pattern and a system that had been in, in, in use for over, over 300 years when, when he did this. Okay, see this number here? Okay. Mm -hmm. And there are four lines here in the, the first line. Yep. Counts of one, two, three, four. You, we get the letter H. Okay. And I put that down here. Okay, here we have the number two. Go up to the next letter. One, two, we have an A. Here's four lines in this word. Well, let's go to, to the next one. Uh, okay, one, two, three, four, we have an R. Five, go to the next number, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, it's, it's, it's E, then we have uh, six. One, two, three, four, f yeah. Anyway, one, two, three, four, five, it's a seven there, so okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, we have a K. Spelling out the name Harek, H-A-R-R-E-K, which is an acceptable medieval Norse name. Good. <laughs> okay. Now, who else but a, a trained cryptographer who was trained in this style of cryptography could even dawned on him that this was there? Mm -hmm. Nobody. I mean, nobody. And no one ever did until, I'll tell you about later on. Now, here we have, I've listed the numbers of lines from 1 through 12. Now, what we do here, we start from, this is the fellow who did the carving. Okay. It was... Uh, 
okay, four places, one, two, three, four, we have, it's a T. Okay. And we have two, we have an O, four, count over, I. Uh, no, four, one, two, three, we have an L. Five, we have another L. Six, we have an I. Seven, it's a K. Six, see. We have an H, five, we have an O, three, we have another A, six, count off six, we have another A, five, and R, four, we have an M. It says Tolik, T-O-L-L-I-K, okay. it's a acceptable Norse, Norse name, Hotame, <laughs> create, uh, carve me. Okay. Now the other side, it was, uh, uh, Harik created me. Harik created me. So Harik wrote it and then Tolik carved it. it. Yeah, according to what it says here. Okay. Okay. And when do I am um, just for my clarification? When do you start seeing these names appearing in the stones? I know you said it's later Norris is around mm -hmm. the 1200s, 1300s. Any before that? In some of these rune stones, do we know? Yeah, there's a uh, the spirit pond stones in along the coast of Maine. Okay. Then we have the the uh, that round stone tower at Newport, Rhode Island, which is still standing. Cool. And those inscriptions are from 1100 and uh, I think it's 1123. And Henricus, who was the bishop of Greenland and Vinland, signed those. He put his name embedded right into those inscriptions. Wow. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> see? So uh, way back in the 1100, they were doing that. Okay. You see. So it is a relatively old practice by this one, or at least a couple hundred years. Yeah. But of course, the, the er, very earliest ones did not have that. No. They did it once in the, say, the late 900s and 10 hundreds. It wasn't until the 11 hundreds, and then, oh, then, then, then they developed it to that point, see, mm -hmm. which, which is understandable uh, why they, they, they would. Now, I have a, it says Sunday, April 24th. Is there a significance about that date? Yes, it is, because that's the date that, that this is dated. Nice. Uh, how do you find out Sunday now? Oh, okay, here we go. <laughs> Wasn't sure if it was some major yeah, day, like no, no, Easter no, no, or okay. a settlement. <laughs> okay, well, one thing you'll notice here, line number two is embedded, is indented four spaces. Mm -hmm. This is just a cut, okay. And line number three is indented four spaces. Okay. Line number nine is indented two spaces. And line number 12 is indented one space. Hmm. Okay. See, see line twelve. Yeah. Okay. So here we have line uh, line twelve, line 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 three, line two. Okay. Twelve is indented one space, as I said. Line number line number two is indented two spaces. Line number three is four spaces, and uh, line number two is two is indented uh, four spaces. So we get the. And only a cryptographer would, would grasp this. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it takes a lot, lots of years and years of study. Okay, sounds like it. <laughs> yes, yes, it does. <laughs> oh boy. So what we have here is uh, what, as it turns out, this one stands for a Sunday, and two two hundred and forty four stands for the number of days counting back from December twenty fourth, which was the last day of the Norse year. Okay. Okay. Now, in order to ha get one of these inscriptions made, you must have a, what they call a perpetual table, a lunar solar table, and an Easter table. This is called a, a, uh, a sort of a perpetual calendar is what this is. And here's what it's called the Easter table. Okay. And you must have one of these if you're going to create one of these cryptograms, okay? <laughs> so they, they all, and plus the priests more like who, who carry these uh, along with them. Now, in your Easter table, and these were developed many centuries before this time, okay. in the early days of Christianity. We have 19 lines here, one through 19, okay? Okay. And each one of these lines beside it is attached dates, okay? And it takes, and the reason they have 19 is because it's called the, the, the metronic, metonic cycle, where the moon, for example, today is in the, in the sky in a certain position. Mm -hmm. It takes 19 years 
for the moon to come back to that exact same position again. Okay. And that's what this 19 stands for. Now, this got a little more involved now. Okay, we have the sun as well, of course, involved in this, you know, okay. Now, today, the sun and the moon are in a particular position. Okay. This is very day as we sit here. Yes. Okay. <laughs> now, it takes 532 years for the sun and the moon to come back in that exact same position again as it is today. Wow. 532 years. So I guess we should enjoy the day. Yeah, please do. <laughs> yes. Anyway, so now that's what, what all these numbers represent. And uh, 19 goes into 532 28 times. Okay. Okay, so we have 19 numbers in this, in this direction and 28 over here. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Yes. And by this, you can pretty well point out any date. Now, for example, in the Kensian runestone, for example, you could, uh, where are we here now? Uh, the 1362, uh, oh yeah, here we are. Okay, we start out with the line 36. Okay. 1336, 36 is 7, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, uh, 60, 61, 60, we come to 14. Okay. Okay. So we have the numbers eight, it's in line eight here. Mm -hmm. Then you go all the way over to, to line 14 to, to get to 1362. And then that's called the, the, uh, the uh, YGN or the, the uh, yearly golden number. This okay. is called the, the d daily golden number. No, this is called a Rati, this is the yearly golden number. Then you go up here, you have the number two. So in identifying the year 1362, the numbers eight, 14, and two are, are identified. Awesome. It identified with the year 1362. Okay. Okay. Now, whichever year you were born in, you can you can do this stuff, do, do, do that too. Cool. So, and yeah, you keep updating this after 532 years. You keep updating it so we can use it right now. Yeah. Okay. And so was, where so, was that developed? Sorry to interrupt, but where was the Easter table developed? Oh, that was I think this brought into use of I think the Council of Nicaea. I think it was in in that era. In okay. The, in the fourth century A.D. Because the, the, the church needed ways of keeping time too, you know. Yes. And they used the Julian calendar with all of this. Okay. Now, so here in the uh, runic inscription, we have okay, 8, 14, and 2 are, are three critical numbers now identifying. Okay. Here we number 8, okay. Here we have 2, and we have, uh, uh, we have 14, okay, 8, 14, and uh, 2. Okay, now that, only a cryptographer will understand this though. Mm -hmm. 8, 14, 2, okay, he was confirming the date 1362 uh, by the, these, the, these numbers here. Awesome. See? Confirming the, the date 1862. Okay, now once again I say that takes a lot of study. <laughs> Just this little explanation, so I'm afraid it's not going to do it, but it gives you an idea as to what the, now how about the number 244? Well, uh, here. You sub subtract from December 24th, go, go back 244 days, you zero in on April 24th. Oh, okay. okay. So it all, it all works together Absolutely. like a puzzle. Now, it's just like the, the number uh, 10 here. The number 10 is twice. Mm -hmm. Now, when you, this is called what they call ND. Uh, that's a term they use for it. Uh, you can count back from, from uh, December 24th, <clears throat> or you can count backwards from October 14th, which is the first day of winter, or the uh, April <clears throat> uh, 14th, which is the first day of summer. Okay. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> here we have the number 10. Okay, now you have the number 10 twice. Okay, that also zeroes in, and then on, on, on April 14th, you have 244. <clears throat> <coughs> These numbers we use strictly, you know, from the first day of, uh, of uh, summer then, which is April, April 14th. You count 10 from there, you zero in on, on April 24th again. Nice. You see? Yeah. But I say only a cryptographer would understand this. And it's only after a lot of study mm -hmm. <laughs> can you grasp this. So, uh, 
So this would be something that would have been taught to, say, the priest who would have probably scribed this, at least not carved it, but scribed it. This would be something the priest would have learned yeah, during they, his studies? they probably learned it in these monastery schools, more than likely. Wow. So, and cryptography in the Middle Eastern, in the middle medieval times, was a big thing. Mm -hmm. See, And these priests that loved to do this, probably it's just a game with each other. Oh, just, I think just it'd be fun. <laughs> yeah. You know, <clears throat> carving these things out of rock, and they expected someone else to come along and probably and look at it and say, well, aha, this is suspicious. Mm -hmm. Oh, stuff like this. There are a number of, and, and when lines are indented, now there's, this is suspicious, you know, mm -hmm. but only a cryptographer will know, see? <coughs> and many of the modern day runologists and historians looked at this and they thought, oh, the, the, the guy who did this is really an amateur. He's, uh, he probably Olaf Holman himself did it. <laughs> you know how, how the Swedes are. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but no way, because not, no runologist or historian back in 1898 was found knew anything about this sort of thing. Wow. And this was not discovered until 1963 by the man by the name of Alf Mange, M-O-N-G-E. Okay. And he was a man who came from Norway when he was about 19, back in the 1930s. And he joined the army. Hmm. And he was a pretty, <coughs> excuse me, a pretty bright fellow, so they made him a cryptographer, sent him to cryptography school. Mm -hmm. And he did a lot of cryptography all during World War II and his army career. And in 1963, he discovered the cryptography in this thing. See, but so you see, it took a cryptographer to discover the cryptography. Makes sense. No one else can do it. See, wow. I don't care how, how big a historian you are or who knowledge is, even in Norway or Sweden, you couldn't even suspect there was anything there. So they attributed all these misspellings. There are a number of misspellings here, by the way, <laughs> and like 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 fro, but he spelled it from F R O M. Well, okay. that. You know, that's, that, that's not an acceptable word. Of course, it's not an acceptable word for the mid 14th century. <laughs> but he needed the M in there for a part of the cryptographic messages. So you have a number of misspellings as well, which you needed to put the secret message in there. Okay. You see, what he did. <clears throat> now so what? Was this the first one of its kind to be deciphered? Um, or had other ones been deciphered prior? No, I, uh, see, I believe this was. If I remember Monji's history correctly, this was the first one that, that he deciphered. Wow. And then he went from this one, of course, to many others. Mm -hmm. See, the ones uh, along the coast of Maine and uh, uh, the, the Newport Tower there in Rhode Island mm -hmm. and those in Oklahoma. Wow. He also deciphered those. Now, those are pure dates ex except for Henricus in the 1100s. Mm -hmm. See, and also he deciphered what we call the Vinland map, okay. which was uh, done in Latin. Nice. I think that's dated August 4th, 1122, and signed Henricus. Mm -hmm. He embedded his name in, in, into this as well, say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that was done in Latin, so he, was a, he could do it in Latin and, and runes both, say. Huh. But as I say, this was probably more than likely a game that, 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 that these people played with, with each other. These, mm. should we say, rune happy monks, <laughs> you see. And they left this here and there, just you know, hopefully that someone else would come along and, and uh, d d discover them. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> of course, that may not always been the case, especially that fellow in eastern Oklahoma, whoever he was. He was very bright. He was more than likely the same man who did the one in uh, Byfield, Massachusetts, okay. dated November 1009. Mm -hmm. And we think that because of the style he used. See, the method, the style of cryptography he used. Mm -hmm. And he left, we have, still have seven of his left, but over three dozen have been, were destroyed blown to pieces by people who are looking for buried treasure in the 1920s and 30s. Oh, uh, isn't that awful? I know. All that fantastic <laughs> historical you know, information lost yeah. during those years. Um, <clears throat> now, whether or not we'll find any more, who knows, time will tell. Mm -hmm. But when they're found, they're found by sheer chance, sheer accident, like this one. Yeah. <laughs> just, just sheer accident, yeah. You don't say, well, I'm going to find a, you know, a ruining inscription over here tomorrow. No, you, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> Is this the only one of its kind that's been found in that area or in the yeah, Midwest yeah, area? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was one found in Ohio. Okay. That was dated 1200 and something, I think it was. But that's the closest to this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But most of them are along the East Coast, and I say there's seven are in eastern Oklahoma, too. Yep. So. Wow. <laughs> So it definitely is quite the spine. Yeah, yeah, and now there's a lot more to this too, but we, you know, in this we don't have the, the, <laughs> the time to do this right now, but at least I'm introducing you to the basic ideas of mm -hmm. the runestone, you see. And sort, sort of giving an overview of, the, uh, of, of what it is and what it, it says in it, see. Okay, well, I th any other questions? 
No, I definitely think I, I want to learn more about it. How, actually, I do have one. How did you get into learning about rune stones and learning about this cryptography? What spar spurned your interest? Your ah, interest? Excellent. I read a book by Yalimar R. Holand, H-O-L-A-N-D, way back, in, oh boy, I think I'd just, just gotten out of the Navy at the time, I think. Mm -hmm. And he wrote about the rune stone, the King's rune stone. Cool. And he wrote a great deal on it. And he, he was the man who kept advertising it. He kept finding out more and more about it. And he sort of kept the knowledge of it alive, really. And he even owned the stone itself for a while. Mm -hmm. Now, he did a lot of excellent work on, on this rune stone. Now, except he did not know about the cryptography. Mm -hmm. You see, so some of his interpretations were, were not, you see, we're off too. <clears throat> it's just likely the numbers here. The eight Swedes or 22 Norwegians or two uh, of islands are, okay, 10 men, uh, 10 men, okay, red with blood, then 14 days travel. See, these numbers, well, maybe there were eight, eight Goths and 22 Norwegians, but not very likely. These numbers referred to the dating. Mm -hmm. Zeroing in on, on uh, well, 1362, of course, too, but also April 24th. Mm -hmm. see? That's what these numbers are really for, and not necessarily identifying the number of men there. See? So, so when, when, when Holland interpreted these, well, there really is, Swedes, there were 22 Norwegians. Well, there may have been, but not very likely. Yeah. Not, not very likely. They're, they're made <laughs> the Swedes and Norwegians. Yes. Yes. <laughs> we can accept that. Mm -hmm. But uh, these particular, no, no. It, it's, it's, it's rather shaky there, see? Yeah. But it's, it's strictly for, for getting to the date, see, of uh, Sunday, April 24, 1362. So, I think that's about ends our little talk. It's very and, interesting. Yes, so thank you. Well, so thank you for listening. No problem.